The leaky condo crisis was a slow burn disaster that took place primarily in British Columbia, Canada, from the mid-90s until around 2007, though some litigation continues to this day. At the core of this crisis is what's called leaky condo syndrome, which is something that became endemic in British Columbia-built condominiums and school buildings that were constructed between the late 80s and early 2000s in the region. This crisis is multifaceted, but generally comes back to a few main issues. First, during that period, the postmodernism architectural design sensibility came into vogue in the area. Meaning, quite suddenly, buildings with elements more often seen in the Mediterranean region and in Southern California were popping up all over BC. What that meant in practice were roofs without eaves, stucco wall cladding, arched windows, and open walkways. All elements that make a lot of sense in warmer regions, but which do not make much sense in chillier, wetter British Columbia. A location in which these elements allow moisture to get places it shouldn't be, resulting in water infiltration, leakage, and in some cases, rampant mold growth. Second, regulatory codes had just changed before this period, and those codes incentivized behavior that amplified this crisis. Namely, elements like roof overhangs were included in floor space measurements, which in turn lowered the maximum possible internal floor space the architects had available to work with if they decided to include these overhangs that were handy in rainy weather and which allowed people outside to shelter under them. But more importantly, structurally, these overhangs kept the rain from accumulating on the walls of the buildings, wearing those walls down over time and seeping into cracks and other flaws. This regulatory change led to the widespread removal of these overhangs, and that led to increased moisture-related problems. Contrarily, those outdoor, open, uncovered walkways that so prominently feature in L.A. condo designs, and which make sense in warm, dry, desert climates, were included more frequently because they were excluded from that floor space ratio calculation, allowing architects to include them without reducing the amount of square footage they could build into the overall unit. Thinner walls were also incentivized under these new regulatory codes, as floor space ratios were measured from outside of what's called the building envelope, the portion of the home that is climate controlled and kept separate from outdoor conditions. The size of the home was measured from outside the building envelope rather than from the inside. What this meant in practice was that the walls were thinner and rain screen systems were flimsier to maximize the square footage. Or I guess it would be the number of square meters, since they use a measurement system that actually makes sense in Canada, of the condos that they were putting up for sale. Third, the new system reduced some of the regulations that had protected contractor fees, leading to what might generously be called a more open market. That more open market, though, combined with a surge of new developers, led to a downward swing in prices, which subsequently led to lower quality standards. That meant cut corners when it came to building materials, less attention paid to design elements, often making use of templated designs rather than hiring designers to work with the specific location and to be on site for the construction, and a tax apparatus that led to a practice in which contractors would set up a new company for each new project they were developing meaning that they would start a business to build a particular building and then that business would be dissolved when the building was completed. This made it far more difficult to pursue legal recourse against these builders and again fed into this surge of sloppy building standards. The uptick in structural issues in these buildings, both condos and schools in BC and elsewhere, though the British Columbia province was most heavily hit, has resulted in four major investigations in Canada to date. 
The Building Envelope Research Consortium was established in 1995 and later became the Building Research Committee. And during its tenure and continuing till today, it operates as kind of a central pivot point around which the research into these problems and development of future standards coordinate. Two of the investigations were undertaken by then-Commissioner Chair Dave Barrett, and as such, they're often colloquially referred to as the Barrett Commissions. These inquiries eventually led to new zoning regulations, building codes, contractor laws, and the institution of local homeowner protection offices. In the aftermath, as tallied so far at least, as this is an ongoing thing, it's estimated that $4 billion in damage has occurred to over 900 buildings and 31,000 individual housing units in British Columbia alone. About 45% of the nearly 160,000 condos that were built during that time period were found to have envelope leak issues, and around 57% of the 700 school buildings that were built during this time were found to have the same. As a result of those investigations, it was determined that 90% of three- and four-story condo units have serious envelope problems and have had to undergo repairs two or three times already. And in 2008, it was estimated that the cost to repair the schools would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $400 million. What I want to talk about today is related to architecture and buildings and building envelopes, but from a somewhat different angle. I will start with an article that is also about building things in British Columbia, though it has a happier ending than this introductory story. And then we will segue into a broader discussion about standards of living and how these standards correlate to our overall levels of happiness. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you are enjoying what you hear, consider becoming a patron. If you go to patreon.com slash let's know things, you can contribute however much makes sense for you and your financial situation each month. And you can also contribute monetarily via PayPal or Venmo. There are all kinds of options in that regard if you go to letsknowthings.com. Also incredibly helpful is if you take the time to leave a review. Probably the best place to do that is on Apple Podcasts, which we formerly called iTunes, but they've undergone a recent rebranding. Apple Podcasts is kind of the source of a lot of podcast apps and other podcast platforms. It starts there, and then it sends out the stream to all of these other podcast resources. And that means if you leave a review there, it'll be more likely to be seen by more people. And that means that more people who do not know this podcast yet and don't know whether or not they should spend 45 minutes to an hour of their time listening to it will be more likely to see your review and be more likely to give it a shot. That seems to be the best way to help spread the word about this type of show, which is a little bit unusual and genre straddling. So taking a minute or so to do that, to leave a review up on Apple Podcasts or wherever, is very, very helpful and doesn't take much time either. A huge thanks to everyone who has already contributed in some way, shape, or form already. Thank you very much. That means a lot. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I want to unspool today comes from Treehugger, which is a website about sustainability and green design and things of that nature. So keep that in mind if you read this piece. This is definitely a website with a point of view. And this article is entitled, Multifamily Passive House Completed in Vancouver. Now, this isn't a very long piece, but it mentions several main points that are important to understanding this facet of the sustainable architecture space. Specifically, what is a passive house? How does a passive house differ from all those other green architectural terms 
that we hear thrown around these days. Well, part of what makes a passive house, or in this case, a passive multi-flat building, fairly remarkable at the moment, is that in most cases, developers who want to focus on building ecologically sustainable housing have been quite keen on the net zero standard. And net zero, the products of which are sometimes called net zero energy buildings or nearly zero energy buildings, for those that get close to the standard, that label essentially means that the building in question produces as much energy as it consumes, and sometimes more energy than it consumes. Net zero buildings, then, are generally more energy efficient on multiple levels, and they are lined with solar panels, or in some cases, solar plus small wind turbines or some other type of renewable energy generation technology. And in many cases, they also have other nice touches like vertical gardens to absorb CO2 and to regulate building temperatures naturally. In my opinion, these are very nice touches. They are positive attributes to have in a building. And it's been very cool to see the architectural world move in that direction. You may also have heard the term LEED certified applied to a particular building or a home. LEED is an acronym that stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And it is a certification program run by the U.S. Green Building Council, which started back in 1993, but which really took off from 1994 onward. While net zero is more of a design philosophy practiced in different ways in different places and approached from different angles, LEED has a fairly rigid point system within different construction type silos. So there are LEED standards for schools, for healthcare facilities, and for housing developments of different sizes, among many other building types. This group then takes a look at the plans and implementation of these buildings and awards points, and the building or complex of buildings then get a rating based on that point system. The points are awarded based on everything from energy efficiency to acoustic comfort and overall aesthetics. These points don't latently mean anything other than bragging rights, but many cities around the world have incentives on the books for builders who rank at a certain LEED certification level, everything from tax benefits to having the mayor show up at your grand opening. The long-term savings of many LEED certified buildings are also quite substantial. It's estimated that, on average, LEED certified buildings cost about 2% more to build up front, but earn more than 10 times that initial investment back over the life of the building. But those savings and the overall energy benefits can vary greatly, in part because of the availability of certain components. They differ from region to region, and in part because the standards are not yet stratified based on climate zone. So the benefits of going for LEED certification can differ from place to place and from building type to building type. A passive house, by comparison, is a little more like a net zero house in that it's a building philosophy, but a little more like lead buildings in that there are specific ways to achieve the desired outcomes and there is a regulating body for this standard that helps make resources available to builders while also banging the drum to make this particular concept more popular. The original guidelines for passive houses were developed in Germany in 1988. The German word for passive house, by the way, is passive house, so try not to forget that. But these guidelines were based on research and construction undertaken by builders in North America in the 70s. And those standards were developed because they were essentially scrambling to make more energy efficient architecture during the OPEC-led oil embargo that was, at the time, crippling aspects of energy-hungry North American infrastructure. The first passive houses were built in 1990, and in 1996, the Passive House Institute was founded in Germany to raise awareness for the standard, but also to determine what the best standards were and what technologies and techniques should be made more widely available to support it. A passive house is a very simple machine. In fact, some architects 
have called them dumb buildings. Because rather than relying on technological wizardry, like solar panels and wind turbines, to achieve lower overall power usage, like a net zero house might do, they are instead just built differently, using mostly easy to access widely available materials. In general, a passive house has far more and far better insulation than a standard house. They tend to have slightly smaller and higher quality windows and well-built doors and other elements. They have high quality ventilation and few, if any, thermal bridges, which are architectural elements that serve as gaps between insulated parts in the design. The space connecting a door and an outside wall, for instance, often serves as a bridge across which heat can transfer and escape a building's envelope to a colder outdoor climate, for instance, crossing that small space between the insulation contained in both wall and door. So passive houses minimize those thermal bridges, among other common architectural flaws. What this adds up to, in practice, is a home with a tight, well-balanced thermal envelope. And if you remember from the intro, the envelope of a home is the space that you keep climate controlled, separate from the outside. This change, this increase in insulation and quality control of basic architectural elements, means that the building is more airtight, the windows let in just the right amount of light, of solar radiation, the ventilation equipment keeps the air at perfect, healthy levels. And thermal bridges are reduced so that you don't have areas that are colder or warmer than others, and you don't have to keep your heater turned on all winter to maintain a comfortable indoor temperature. The end result of this approach is that the air is cleaner, the temperature is steady and perfect and uniform throughout the home at all times, the lighting is ideal, and the cost of operation is negligible. On that last point, passive houses generally have an operational energy cost that are 75 to 95 percent lower than a typical comparable home, meeting all modern energy standards, which are themselves already quite a bit more intense than those of homes that were built a few decades ago. And those benefits are achieved without reliance on any technological cleverness, without having to generate new energy to make up for energy consumed. Because of how it's built, because of the techniques utilized, these buildings are just naturally passive in the sense of being very close to net zero in their default climate-related energy usage. So you may be wondering, if passive houses are so rad, if they are the architectural cat's meow, why aren't all buildings passive? Part of the reason, no doubt, is that they cost more up front, more than LEED certified buildings even, which, as I mentioned, usually cost around 2% more than a comparable building from the get-go. Passive homes, because of the different standards, which can require specialization that not all contractors have, and because of the higher costs of insulation and high-quality windows and doors, can cost 5 to 10% more up front, which is a substantial amount of money. The energy cost savings after that can also be substantial, of course, but that is an issue, and it becomes even more of an issue when you consider that passive homes tend not to have those trendy, floor-to-ceiling windows, because that type of window is terrible in terms of energy efficiency and air tightness. Passive homes also tend to be somewhat smaller in terms of usable square footage. You are using more of your internal space for thicker, better insulated walls, remember. So those and similar concerns make these types of homes tougher sells on the real estate market. Because although, hey, massive energy savings, you also have to try to sell a relatively smaller home without those fancy, dramatic, full-wall windows and other very marketable but energy-inefficient elements to people who are shopping around. And unless you are selling to a market that is super educated about energy usage and that is willing to make that upfront investment for lower costs year to year, why wouldn't they choose the less expensive bigger, more windowful and decorative option. So this piece 
on Treehugger was an interesting read in part because it provided the excuse to dig deeper into all of these architectural energy standards. And there are far more standards than the ones I already mentioned, by the way, which is overall a good thing, but also kind of confusing to the non-architect public, I think, which isn't so good. But it was also interesting because it tied into something else that I've been thinking about a lot recently, something that was decently well addressed in a recent article on sciencealert.com, a piece that secondarily links to a few studies that make some very compelling points about consumption and happiness. That piece on sciencealert.com is entitled, There Might Be No Way to Live Comfortably Without Also Ruining the Planet. And yes, part of the rationale for discussing that article first, instead of the underlying pieces to which it links, which are, in my opinion, better on many levels, is that it presents the lead right there in the headline. It's kind of a shocking statement, though it's also a statement, I think, that has the ring of truth to it, even before we dig deeper into the data that it uses to support that thesis. One of the main pieces that that article links to is more my speed in terms of what I look for in sources, though, and it is a website set up by researchers at the University of Leeds, and the website is called A Good Life for All Within Planetary Boundaries, and it contains a collection of data that seems to show, as the introductory paragraph of their website succinctly states, that, quote, no country in the world currently meets the basic needs of its citizens at a globally sustainable level of resource use, end quote. Now, that may seem like a big claim, but it's actually just a fancy way of stating something that's become a bit of a truism, if not something that we can necessarily say with absolute authority. Countries that have higher standards of living, as we currently measure such things anyway, which I'll talk about more in a few minutes, they use way more resources than is sustainable over the long term. Countries that stay within their sustainable resource consumption threshold, on the other hand, tend to have lower than average standards of living. Or, said another way, as this piece might phrase it, there is a correlation between the social thresholds achieved and the biophysical boundaries transgressed by countries for which such data is available. I will link to this site in the show notes, and it's worth checking out if for no other reason than to play with all the interesting interactive graphs and charts, which allow you to compare, for instance, the quantities of phosphorus emitted by a country compared to the percentage of people living there who have access to improved sanitation infrastructure. Lots of interesting data there and ways to crunch it together. But to give away the ending here, the conclusions reached by the researchers was that although the basic needs of everyone on the planet can almost certainly be reached without overstepping in terms of resource usage, meaning everyone on the planet can have access to food, clean water, sanitation services, basic education, and so on, the same is not true of other goals, like access to high-quality secondary education inessential consumables like clothing for fashion and self-expression rather than protection from the elements, and the vast array of entertainment options and non-survival-related technologies that we take for granted in much of the developed world today. In other words, our current standards of comfort, not even excess, just comfort, in many places around the world seem to conflict with the goal of not destroying the world to not live beyond our means in such a way that some type or perhaps even many types of ecological cataclysm ensues. Now, it's important to note, before we go any further down this particular wing of this discussion, that there is a difference between standard of living and quality of life. Standard of living is generally a more quantifiable metric. It takes into account things like average, high, and low income levels, class disparity numbers, the amount of work that is required to earn enough to pay your rent and buy groceries, the quality and availability of employment that will help you attain that income, the inflation rate, the gross domestic product, the average life expectancy, the 
quality and availability of infrastructure, and the level of safety and security enjoyed by locals. Quality of life overlaps with standards of living in some regards, but it also includes less quantifiable metrics that don't make the standard of living list. How, for instance, would you accurately measure the freedom from discrimination numerically? How would you measure the happiness derived from the right to marry the person you love or the freedom of speech? How much value is added to your life knowing that you have the freedom of movement? And how does that compare with the value you derive from having the right to equal pay for equal work? So while making more money on average can be a part of enjoying a happy life and is often correlated with happiness up to a point, it's not the only issue taken into account when we are talking about quality of life. When we talk about living a good life then, we're talking about that intersection of these two measurements, but we're particularly trying to get a grasp on how much our bigger picture happiness not our GDP or the availability of infrastructure, but the happiness we might feel as a consequence of those things and of many other things, like the freedom of religion and the freedom of thought, how that intermingles with our use of resources. And what the stats seem to show is that societies in the upper echelons of happiness also tend to be in the upper echelons of consumption not at universally the same level, and consuming a whole lot is not a guarantee that you will build a happy society. There's not a demonstrated causal relationship here, but the correlation is strong, and that forces us to ask ourselves whether or not we will be able to maintain high standards of living, high levels of happiness, while also reducing our overall footprint in terms of energy consumption, waste production, societal sprawl, and things like that. Conversations of this kind always make me wonder, what if we hadn't, as a global culture, developed the way that we have? And I'm speaking very broadly here and focusing particularly on the Western standard and offshoots of that, which have spread dramatically and widely in recent generations as a consequence of the success of liberal democracies in the 20th century and the cultural hegemony that was amplified by mass media during that same period. There are a lot of ways of living, and many societies buck this trend, but the general broad-brush worldwide culture that has flourished during the lifetime of everyone alive today is predicated on a certain model of consumption a relatively small range of success metrics, and a common understanding of what role a person plays as a part of their society. It's that development model that I am talking about in this case. What if things had gone differently? What if World War II had ended differently and the second half of the 20th century had been defined by authoritarian governments and modern monarchs to a lesser degree, rather than liberal democracies and a globalized version of capitalism? What if, somewhat less dramatically, we had taken seriously earlier warnings that our newfound conception of the middle class and how we showed we were a part of it had been truncated, our standards changing before they really took off? What if we never developed suburbia, never invented SUVs, never developed new industries predicated almost entirely on disposable packaging? What if we, through some adjustment in historical fate, did not celebrate consumption the way that we commonly do today? What if our economy wasn't predicated on growth, growth, and more growth, lest the whole thing fall apart? What if modern media, from the newspaper onward, had been fueled by some other monetary mechanism rather than advertisements? What if real estate had been more heavily regulated from the start, and as a consequence, we didn't romanticize and idealize huge real estate footprints and giant, wall-spanning, energy-inefficient windows? I ask these questions not because the answers are at all useful in helping us figure out what to do in a world in which the opposite is the case, in which all of these things have happened. We can't turn back the clock. 
now that these possibilities have become realities, now that we've taken this one particular fork, series of forks, in the historical timeline. I ask these questions instead because I think that doing so may help us realize that none of these things were destined to occur. There are other mechanisms for funding media. There are other types of real estate, even today, that serve their residents just as well or better than sprawling McMansions and giant condos with inefficient insulation. There are other economic models, other ways to package and distribute goods, other modes of transportation. And if such things are not destined, are not the only way that the world could have developed, that means that our perception of their rightness, of them being more legitimate than other options, more correct, possibly even being the only way things could have shaken out realistically, that must also be false. This is something that we all know intellectually, I think, but it can be valuable to be reminded of this fact, that the way things are is not the way things must have been, and therefore, the way things are is not the only way things can be. It can be helpful to remember this when shuffling the numbers and figuring out how we might adjust our standards of living to achieve different outcomes. But it also applies to that other standard, to our conception of quality of life. There's a reason so many of us feel reinvigorated after going camping or traveling for a time overseas or even perusing Instagram for photos of tiny houses, imagining how our lives might be different if we were to reduce our footprint, if we were to own one one-hundredth of what we own today. There's a reason hashtag van life is trending across social media and minimalist wardrobes are all the rage. The resetting of our standards, even for a short time, allows us to step away from what we have come to take for granted, to see as normal, to perceive as being sea level. And then when we return to our old normal, having lived that new normal, even if just for a time, we are then more capable of seeing our old lives for what they really are, which in the case of van lifers and minimalists often means that they recognize they owned more than they needed. They had been accumulating just to accumulate because that's what seemed to be prudent according to those old standards. Now, this is not to say that everyone will be happy living out of a Winnebago or owning only what fits into a carry-on bag, but many of us accumulate not because it makes us happy, but because we're trained to do so from a very young age. And we're trained to believe that this accumulation is both natural and desirable, if not noble, and for the greater good. It keeps the economy ticking. It gives us that temporary jolt of purchasing pleasure. And it is correct in some vague way, according to the standards to which we have been acclimated. The standards of vast floor plans, multiple large closets, and buying things as a means of self-expression. Resetting those personal standards, though, and living with less space, fewer requirements, fewer expectations, or maybe just different expectations, for a time, can recalibrate the part of our brain that tells us what we need to be happy. You return from a week of camping, look around the house, and are boggled by how you ended up with so much stuff. All these possessions, which previously seemed normal, not excessive, can feel overwhelming cluttered after even just a little bit of time away, time with less, with fewer things, with different expectations and standards of living. Maybe you return after doing missionary work in a rural region of a developing country, only to find that 99% of what you own isn't doing you any good. It's just kind of sitting there. Plus, that hot shower that you always took for granted before you left is now the best thing ever, now that you've gone without a regular hot shower for months. Our conception of normal within any space, any realm of inquiry, is dependent on our taught expectations, but also our day-to-day -day routines and lifetime experiences. If we're brought up believing that it's important to own a massive wardrobe full of clothing, and you'll maybe wear each piece once or twice before discarding them, then that becomes normal. That's correct. If we grow up with several walk-in closets reserved for us and us alone, chances are the quantity of clothing required to feel normal and correct will be even higher. 
If you grow up living out of a car, though, or a bag, or perhaps living in a home with a smaller footprint with less space, your understanding of normalcy when it comes to your wardrobe size will be different. This same rule applies across the board for everything from clothing ownership to home square footage to energy consumption and waste production. So all that in mind, both the conversation about happiness and consumption and the idea that perhaps by resetting our standards, we could change the current default, the current sense of normal. There are two connected questions that I want to ask. First, is it actually true that we can't both enjoy today's standards of living and return the planet to a healthy balance, as that data I mentioned previously seems to indicate? And second, if we do need to change things to adjust our standards so that we don't, you know, destroy the planet, might we change them in such a way that we don't feel like we're sacrificing, even though our standards would, in fact, be changing, and perhaps in a way that would be perceived as negative by today's sense of normal? To answer that first question, we have to take a look at the current state of the planet and then extrapolate upon today's efforts to counteract some of what is happening in that space. And as anyone who's been paying attention to the world of science journalism knows, things don't exactly look great when it comes to maintaining the planetary equilibrium that we have enjoyed since the development of agriculture and the consequent development of civilization. Or rather, things don't look great for the mean set of ecological standards that we have come to take for granted and which we, and most of the flora and fauna in our global food web, have evolved. Those norms are shifting, and shifting very hard, and the two degrees Celsius on average change that we've been trying to prevent, and that we've long perceived as a worst-case scenario, because at that point things will become far worse than even a one and a half degree Celsius change, well, it's looking increasingly likely that we're not even going to be able to prevent that. Most of the more recent data we have available paints a very sobering picture that indicates that we are on one of the worst, most pessimistic trajectories when it comes to climate change, and as a result, everything changing around us. And that means that we're going to see more extreme weather, higher ocean levels, and all kinds of variation in our traditional croplands. Some new areas will open up, but many of the rules that we understand when it comes to producing food today will no longer apply in the very near future. There will be, and already have been, mass die-offs in species that are sensitive to even minute changes in average temperature and other generally stable systems like oceanic acidity. And that means food webs all over the place will be collapsing, leading to secondary and tertiary die-offs of key species that we rely on. All that said, there is a lot being done to try to prevent things from becoming even worse than they already are and are set to become. None of these efforts are moving as quickly as those who have seen this coming for decades would like, but better late than never, I guess. And now that it's becoming economically viable and economically required in some cases to invest some money in these issues, many industries are shifting toward cleaner alternatives. We are also seeing reinvigorated efforts toward cleaner systems and clean energy that will help connect and power all the new models of cars and homes and technologies that are meant to help reduce the impact of climate issues, which is a good thing. We are going to need to do a whole lot of infrastructural refurbishment if these things that are currently the sexy green solutions are actually going to work as advertised. To address that first question directly, I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility that we could continue to maintain today's standards of living while also pushing things in a better direction ecologically. Imagine, for instance, if the whole world began to build passive buildings exclusively, making that upfront investment but dramatically lowering the energy upkeep costs of all future construction projects. Imagine further that we then applied net zero technologies on top of that, meaning all the homes would be around 85% more energy efficient 
but would also produce enough energy to offset the energy usage of today's old-fashioned, non-passive homes. And all that energy would be produced using clean, renewable methods and connected to a smart grid so it could be sent where it's needed, when it's needed, and saved when it's not. There's a lot of potential there. And that's a scenario that doesn't require any new futuristic technologies and developments, which we can't possibly predict, and therefore should not include in our planning. So even without those potential beneficial wildcards along the way, this seems like a possibility to me, especially if we take that concept that I just outlined and expand it to everything that we do, not just our housing. But that said, it's also important to remember that the standard of living I'm talking about here, that of the United States and other developed countries, that's a standard that's expanding its footprint and availability, but it is still far from being evenly distributed. The levels of extreme poverty around the globe have dropped precipitously since 1990. This is actually something that we can be extremely proud of as a species, as it bucked all of the trends up till that point, and we were able to reduce the percentage of people around the world living in extreme poverty from 37.1% in 1990 to 9.6% in 2015. That's an inarguably wonderful thing, and we should not forget to recognize and celebrate victories of that kind. But, of course, as with many important things, there's still a lot of work to be done. That number is not, today, dropping the way that it used to. And in some parts of the world, even though the overall numbers of people who are severely impoverished are still dropping, there has been a regression where people who had not been impoverished are becoming impoverished, primarily due to changes in politics and economics, and in some cases, due to a rapid change in the environment. All of which is to say that it's nice to wonder and worry about whether we can maintain today's standards without destroying the planet around us, but I would argue that the conversation doesn't go far enough, as one of the major goals of today will still be relevant tomorrow, and that means economically uplifting that final almost 10% of the global population to a more secure, stable standard of living so that they might be capable of pursuing a higher quality of life, whatever that might mean for them. And that means not only do we need to worry about replacing all of our fancy gadgets and nice homes with more efficient, less wasteful versions of the same, we also need to upgrade the systems that underpin our economy and governments. Because the systems we have now seem to have plateaued in terms of getting that last 10% on board along with the rest of us. We can't say for certain that our current systems rely on having such inequalities in place to function, but we can't say that they don't either, which is a disconcerting thought. To answer that second question about how, if we do need to change some things, perhaps even radically, how we might do so in a beneficial way, so that we are perhaps even better off than before, I would point out that we're already seeing the initial stages of this in subcultures around the world and across different spaces. There are pushbacks against toxic chemicals, excessive packaging, sprawling homes, overflowing closets, the frantic accumulation of possessions, advertisements, abusive employment situations, the destruction of habitats and societies in the pursuit of scarce materials or cheap labor. We're also seeing movements centered around the idea of redefining happiness, of establishing a sense of self-worth separate from how other people feel about you or what job title you hold. There are efforts to temper the downsides of online broadcasting to better utilize those same tools in different directions. There are people who are dedicating their lives to reapplying the technologies and techniques and systems that allow us to build iPhones to instead build reliable social and economic infrastructure for folks who live in the middle of nowhere, barely scraping by, to help them become better represented, their needs, hopes, and potential contributions recognized by the larger human ecosystem. But, of course, there's almost always pushback against any change, no matter the scale of that change. Big adjustments, in particular, tend to face an equal and opposite pushback, funded and flogged forward by those who stand to lose the most as a consequence of that shift. And make no mistake, there would be many 
losers, especially in the short term, no matter how many may win in the long term, if we were to succeed in establishing all these new norms, if we were to use all this technology, all our capabilities, all of our resources, both tangible and intangible, to recalibrate the scale towards some new metric, if we were to change our global attitudes in such a way that our energy usage and waste production numbers would nudge us back away from the brink, away from the worst possible consequences that we might otherwise face. Even recognizing those potential consequences, though, it's easy enough to understand the combative mentality shared by these entities that would suffer or cease to be were such realignments to be successful. Consider the coal industry, for instance. From the outside, it's simple enough to shake a fist at those running these coal mining and burning companies, to marvel at their inhumanity, at how they're ruining the planet for their own personal profit. But from their perspective, they are operating under today's expectations to maximize profits, but also to propagate their interests. They want to be able to keep earning a living for themselves, but also for all of their workers, all the people who run the restaurants in these coal mining towns, all the banks that have loaned money to coal miners who want to buy a house, to all of the businesses around the world who rely on energy from these companies. They are justifiably worried about the repercussions of a realignment of standards away from burning fossil fuels. And frankly, there isn't a good counterargument to that. Yes, the data shows that they are massive contributors to global problems that could doom us all. But what, are they just going to close down their business? Fire all their people? Tell them that they are now economically destitute, unable to pay their bills or feed their families. And all that within a system that tells these people that they are nothing if they can't earn money. And importantly, if they can't earn more and more money to buy all the things that they need to be complete. And all of these people are operating within a system that does not, currently at least, have a good model for helping out people who suddenly find themselves with skills that do not translate well to other positions in other industries. I think most of us, no matter how planet-loving, would have trouble instigating that kind of transition, knowing how many people would suffer as a direct consequence of our actions. From that perspective, a lot of these actions, a lot of these attitudes, a lot of these pushbacks make a whole lot more sense. Yes, they might be contributing to the destruction of the planet, that's kind of a vague concept, and they are relatively minor players in that destruction. This is something that they would be doing personally to a bunch of people whose faces they recognize and names they know. And that reality cannot help but shape their decisions in that regard. We have been sold for our entire lives on certain ways of doing things. And our parents and their parents have as well. We've all been handed this set of standards, this way of doing things that we then come to reinforce in countless ways, both culturally and economically. And even those who recognize the flaws in these standards find it difficult to extract themselves from the systems that propagate them because they're so all-encompassing. They have, in a very real, literal way, shaped the world around us. Now, we could, I believe personally, be sold on different standards. We could change the script, adjust the storylines that we absorb from birth to death, and tell the next generation about, and over time, change out our current large-scale perceptions of success and failure, of luxury and austerity, of what it means to have and what it means to have not. This would almost certainly require changes to our economic systems, our cultural mores, our governmental models, and our individual self-definitions. It would demand fundamental changes to our expectations about architecture and consumption, but also our understanding of what it means to be happy, or at the very least, what it means to be in the position to pursue happiness. I would argue, then, that yes, it is possible to make these types of grand changes to human society, to everything about the way that we operate, and have operated for a very long time, but that it wouldn't be easy. It's difficult to even imagine how things might look once all those changes had been implemented. These changes take place slowly over time, of course, already, but this shift would need to be more intentional and rapid, and that would almost certainly look different from the slow iterations that we've seen throughout history thus far. That said, I also think it's possible that despite the difficulty 
of instigating such changes, it would quite possibly also be the case that we would be far better off for having made them. Not just in the sense of having a more stable ecosystem, but also in the sense of being more liberated to pursue what's important to us, and perhaps even be capable of being more focused throughout our lives, less reliant on current models that have evolved over the generations, and which arguably don't serve us terribly well anymore, except by the standards that they are connected to. Standards that arguably are no longer as relevant to our well-being. If you are enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a patron. If you go to patreon.com slash let's know things, you can contribute however much makes sense for you. Every little bit helps, and any amount contributed monthly will grant you access to a few additional bonuses, including a call-to-action free version of the show. If you're wondering what that means, this that you are listening to right now is a call to action, as is the similar statement at the beginning of the show after the intro. Those things are taken out of the Patreon version so that you can enjoy just the show by itself without the periodic ask for reviews and patronage. I'm also always experimenting with other little bonuses for patrons, so if you are into that kind of thing, patreon.com slash let's know things might be a great way to help contribute to this show. Another great way to help contribute is to leave a review up on Apple Podcasts, share the show with a friend or with your social network of choice. And if you're into books, you might consider purchasing one of the books that I have written. You can find a complete list of those at colin.io. Instead of a book today, I'd like to recommend another podcast, one that I actually only heard about recently and which I took the last two days to binge listen to. It was so good that it kept me almost entirely engrossed. And this podcast is called Slow Burn. It is produced by Slate, and it is an in-depth look into the Watergate crisis. And Watergate is, of course somewhat relevant to happenings today. There are similarities there, a lot of dissimilarities as well, but there are a lot of similarities politically to what was going on back then and what is happening now in U.S. politics. But it was particularly interesting to me. I have a little bit of a journalism background, and one of my favorite books back in the day was All the President's Men, which is the book by Woodward and Bernstein, the reporters who uncovered a whole lot of the intrigue happening behind the scenes during the whole Watergate thing. And as much detail as there is in that book, this podcast uncovered some additional things that I don't remember hearing about. Some additional characters who were involved, some alternative perspectives from which to view everything that happened, everything that went down, and in what order. And some of these things only actually became relevant years later as we discovered more. We discovered who Deep Throat was. We discovered how all of the documents and such connected to each other. So this is a really interesting story about a historical event that is somewhat relevant to what's happening today, but primarily it's interesting for its historical relevance, and it is a story very well told. That podcast, again, is called Slow Burn, and it is produced by Slate. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com, and you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode at letsnotethings.com. Feel free to reach out and say hello on social media. I am at Colin is my name pretty much everywhere on the web. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week.